Okay, let's get started on this nerdy session about logic, mathematics, systems. My name is Byron Cook. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about some work that uh, myself and folks in my, my group and some partners that we're working with are working on. Um, let's start with the idea of the shared security model. So maybe you've uh, heard, heard of this as a, a common refrain from uh, customers and folks in AWS. So the idea of the shared security model is that together we're trying to create a secure environment that we're running in. AWS is, is uh, w working to create a secure uh, infrastructure that customers can, can, can build upon. So we have compute and storage and database networking. We're trying, uh, working to make those uh, pieces of infrastructure secure, and then customers are responsible for their data, for the configuration of their networks, configuration for their, of their IAM policies, uh, operating systems, these kinds of things. So when we talk about uh, security, and when we're asking questions about security in the cloud, there are two, in some sense, two classes of questions that come up. So the first class is um, in regards to customers being secure in the cloud. So, so questions that, that might arise in this context are things like, could my IAM policy allow unintended uh, users access to my S3 bucket? Another question you, you know, you, we might ask, am, am I allowing, for example, only one instance in my VPC to send out going network packets? These are the kinds of, kinds of questions that the customers are often asking, and that's these kinds of questions are, when, when, when you're thinking about them, they're really talking about the customer side of the, sh of the shared security model. The other class of questions are, are more about securing the cloud infrastructure itself. So how do we know that the AWS crypto primitives are correctly implemented? How do we know that the virtualization layer d doesn't suffer from memory cor corruption bugs that would, that, would, that would result in memory corruption based attacks. These are, these are the sorts of questions that customers are asking AWS, and these are obviously the sorts of questions that, that folks within AWS are, 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 um, are, are uh, wanting to make sure don't arise. And so these, these types of questions are uh, more about the infrastructure inside the AWS um, uh, APIs. So when we're um, in, in the, the, the group that I work in and the, the folks in my team where we're applying mathematics, logic, constraint solving, these kinds of techniques to security, there's really t two areas that we're working on, right? Both the customer facing side and the, and the internal side. So what is, what, what is AWS doing uh, outside of the area of logic and mathematics for customers? So for example, we have a Amazon Inspector, we have Config Rules, Cloud Trail, we have a number of APIs and customers can use these APIs and services um, to help understand the, the, the security of their networks, of their instances, of their policies in the cloud. Another thing is, so we're involved in mechanized reasoning and mathematical logic to provide additional insurance. And this is really the subject of this talk, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a, a lot more about this in a few moments. On the securing the cloud side, so in, within AWS, we do extensive penetration testing, continuous monitoring, uh, uh, extensive compliance certification programs, et cetera, and then we're also involved in mechanized reasoning and mathematical logic uh, to provide additional assurance. So in this talk, the two questions I'm, I'm aiming to answer is, what is mechanized reasoning and mathematical logic, and what are some examples of what AWS are doing in this space? So let's start at the beginning uh, to, 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 to describe what math, mechanized reasoning and mathematical logic is. So from the beginning, essentially, of recorded history, we see people trying to, to, to reason about the infinite using finite reasoning, right? So there are, are an infinite number of prime numbers. Euclid pro proved that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. He didn't count them all, right? So he used an argument based on this concept of axioms and, and, a, and a, an argument in logic to convince himself and his contemporaries and then f folks in the future that there are an infinite number of primes and no one has ever counted them all, right? And so that, this is a, 
uh, a common game. So Girdle's incompleteness theorem, Turing's halting problem on decidability proof, et cetera. Um, and there's, there's actually two activities, and they're quite distinct in the area of mathematical logic. The first is actually quite a creative endeavor, right? It's the search for a proof. There are many possible proofs. And creative individuals think really hard about the problem and will find a proof expressible in a particular uh, logic. So, so a particular set of axioms and they will construct an argument in that, in that, set of, in that, in that logic to try and convince their, their colleagues that, that something holds. The second activity is, in a, is by design should be really boring. It's the process of checking all of the steps. Right, so I've, I've found a creative argument, I've expressed it in logic, and I want that replay of the argument to be something anyone can do forever. So, so you know, I, for, for example, Turing's halting problem on decidability. I didn't find that proof of undecidability, but I've explained it a thousand times to people. Right, and it's, each step is super simple. You explain, well, we know this, and by, because of that we know this, and each step people are like, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it, and then you get, to the proof, the proof is done, and then often people don't understand the proof in its entirety, but the whole point of proof and logic is that you only need to in understand each of the steps and, and in, their, in, in their totality, you now have a proof of the thing you were out to, out to prove. So in some sense, finding the argument is harder. Checking the argument should, by definition, be easier. Checking is often quite boring, and so what, what tends to happen is that the the proofs, historically, the proofs have, had a bit, have been a little bit wrong because no one has the attention to detail to go through all the tiny little minute steps and, and make sure that they, that they all hold. And that's, a, that's an area in mathematics that, that crops up again and again. So, what, what, so what's, and I'm, I'm writing down 1970s, 80, there's been, well, there was work before and there's work after, but the 1970s is really where you, where you begin to see this nascent area rise. So the, the, from the 1970s on, what we begin to see is humans finding the proof in logic, but then software mechanically checking the proof. So, you, so some creative individual or a group of creative individuals uh, find a proof, they express the proof in a machine readable and checkable format, and then typically a sim very simple theorem prover mechanical theorem prover goes off and checks each of the steps and makes sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, et cetera. And again, m many of these, th these historical theorems have been, pro have been proved mechanically and, and they've convinced a mechanical theorem prover that the, that, the, that the proof's here. I put down here the four color theorem, which is probably one of the most famous um, theorems uh, that, were, that, were, that were mechanically checked. Oh, but then another interesting uh, side effect is that the folks, same folks doing proofs about mathematical artifacts uh, became interested in improving things about industrial artifacts, right? So it turns out that industrial artifacts and mathematical artifacts are in some sense the same. They're typically an infinite graph, edges between maybe a state system representing uh, possible transitions between states, and the, um, you know, the, uh, Helicopter control software, Mars Rover, Mar Mars Rover control software, Intel CPU, superscalar out of order, uh, pipeline, all of these devices are in some sense very similar to mathematical uh, artifacts and the same techniques that one uses to prove the correctness of, uh, of uh, the things that have been asserted in mathematics can, can also, the same techniques can be used to, to prove things about uh, the artifacts in, in, in industry where uh, security, safety, these kinds of things are super important. So that's, that's been an interesting area. And then starting around 2000, there, have been, there were some algorithmic breakthroughs, I'm gonna to touch on them briefly, that allowed us now to both mechanically find and mechanically check um, proofs of both mathematical theorems and, and of uh, industrial artifacts. So I, could lecture for two years on this topic, uh, but I've been informed that I only have an hour. So I'm gonna um, instead, j I just wanna leave you, there's gonna be a mixture, there's gonna be some folks in the crowd who have studied logic and mathematics and proof and that, and you're like, I'm at reInvent, I'll go to this, this talk, and, and some folks, this, this might be new to you, 
what I'm going to try and do is convey a couple of high-level ideas and also throw out some buzzwords. So if you're interested in knowing more, you can look them up with your, you know, on the internet, and the buzzwords will get to where you need to be, right? So you can you can read the the, the papers that introduce the concepts. Um, but but I, I hope that you walk away from this piece of the talk knowing sort of two insights that 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 show you how it is we can do what we can do. Okay. So the first core idea is there's this. There's this idea of making what are MP-complete problems feel like p-time problems. So I've a little decoder ring. Uh, p-time stands for polynomial time, and in practice, it just means tractable. It's the it's the problems for which we can pretty easily build algorithms for and solve, and they scale well, right? Like you 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 give it a hundred inputs, you give it a thousand inputs, you give it a million inputs, you get a uh, a growth in the the, the performance that scales well with the size of the input. MP complete are the, that's short for non-deterministic non polynomial time. These are the intractable problems, the ones that works great when you have five inputs, but then when you have 10 inputs, suddenly it, it takes three lifetimes, right? And, and encryption is really based on, 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 on this concept, if, you, if, you're, if you're familiar with how, how encryption typically works. Um, so although, the, I'm not claiming that MP equals P. What I'm saying is that there are some algorithmic advances that in many common industrial applications can make NP feel like P often. And so we can take advantage of that. So the, here, here are the buzzwords. So there's this idea of conflict clause driven learning, back jumping, random restarts, SAT, and, and what we call SMT, SAT modulo theories. I'm not gonna tell you what these are. I'm just th th throwing these out there. So if you, if you wanna, you know, look for uh, conflict clause driven learning, you'll find some research papers which, which talk about this area. And we're, by the way, I'm gonna go through a couple of examples in a moment. So the other key idea that I wanted to convey to you was this idea that there are, there are undecidable problems. So there are problems for which there cannot exist an algorithm that solves it, right? So the halting problem was one of the first, uh, 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 one, of the, one of the first proofs of the existence of a problem that was, was undecidable. And yes, they are undecidable, but in practice, we can make undecidable problems feel decidable with a little bit of trickery. And so, again, here are the buzzwords. Uh, there's this idea of counterexample guided abstraction refinement, which is very popular in the, in the research literature on the topic. There's this idea of interpolation that people are using quite a bit. Um, and again, buzzwords, and I'm not going to describe them. So here are a couple of names of tools. So Yikes and Minisat are some really nice open source tools that, that solve, for example, the uh, SMT, the SAT modular theory problem, or the propositional SAT uh, uh, problem. They do it very efficiently, and, and, you, and you can use them, and, and a lot of folks do. And, uh, and the uh, area of making undecidable problems feel decidable, there are some open source tools for, uh, for example, Cock Theorem Priver and, and Jhorn. There, there, there are a number. I've just thrown out a couple, but if you look into these, and you'll there'll, there'll be more there. So I wanted to give, to give you a little bit of intuition as to as to how these techniques work. So I'm going to give you a puzzle, and I'm going to give you a second or two to think about it. So what we're in search for, what we're wanting to know, is this call to the command error reachable? Can we hit error? Yeah? And so the question is, can you in your mind think of values for u and uh, w and x and y and z such that we go into the conditional and we hit the command error? So I'm going I'm to be quiet for a moment and let you think about it. If, by the way, if there are questions, I'm going to hang out after the end of the talk so I can take questions then. OK. So maybe you've found a way to get into error, or maybe not. Let's explore, right? So here's a, what we call a, here's, here's an assignment to the variables. And the question is, is this a, is this a satisfying assignment? Could, is the valuation of this formula true, thus allowing us to hit error? So let's see. No. It's not. So it, with these values of the variables, we would not hit error because w is less, w needs to be less than x, but actually w in this case is 3 and x is 1. Thus, the first conjunct would fail, and we would not hit the error. 
So let's try and fix that by making x larger. So what about now? No, because x is not less than y. x is actually greater than or equal to y. Right? x is 18, y is, is 10. So thus, the second chunk contract fails. So this search that we're doing uh, could go on for a very long time. Right? Uh, uh, if so this is, this, is, this is the propositional lo logic satisfiability problem if we limit the range of the variables to, to finite bit vectors, right? So if we assume that u and w and x, et cetera, are 32-bit integers, then we would need to explore 2 to the 35 times 5 possible combinations to convince ourselves that there are no satisfying assignments or to find one in the worst case. And so this is traveling salesman, this is MP heart, this is the MP complete, this is, this is the, 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 that's, that's the, a classic example of an intractable problem, right? And if we add five more variables, now we're really in trouble, right? If we r allow u and w and x to range over mathematical integers, or the reals or the rationals, uh, then this is no longer a finite problem, though it actually turns out to be decidable. Um, but I, I can't tell you how many possible combinations. There's an infinite number of combinations. Right? So, so you have to do something even more creative. Right? So this is, and this is called the satisfiability modular theories problem. Right? If, we, we, if we assume that x and y, for example, range over the, over the reals, then we're no longer talking about bit vectors. We're no longer expressible in prepositional logic. And so we're, we're talking about what we call in the, in the literature satisfiability modular theories. So, now what I wanted to do is to just show you in a couple of pictures how the, the tools that actually really do, so there are tools that take millions of variables and very complicated formulae and solve them very fast. So how is it that these tools work? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just a small example and a little bit of intuition there. So, so here's our formula and we're trying to ask, is there a satisfying assignment to this formula? And if not, please build a proof that there isn't one. And what the tools are going to do is they're going to, zero in on this disjunction, right? So we know that for this formula to be true, that w does have to be less than z, and x has to be less than y, et cetera. But this disjunction is a slightly more interesting case where only one of them really has to be true. And what these tools do is they case split. So they say, let's assume that x is greater than or equal to z, or let's assume that u is less than 3, and go through those cases. Yeah. When x is greater than or equal to z, you'll notice it's, not, it's never possible because of how a, of a quality work, the, qual, the transitivity of, a qual, of, of less than, sorry. By the transitivity of less than, it's never possible for x to be less than y, y to be less than z, but for x to be greater than or equal to z, right? We, we know from x less than y and y less than z that x is less than z, and thus it can't be that x is greater than or equal to z. So thus, no matter what's going on with the w less than z or the u greater than 10 or anything else we add there, uh, this will never become true. So thus, the red is a dead end. And over on the right-hand side, it's never possible for u to be less than 3 but it's simultaneously greater than 10. Right? So actually, neither of them Neither branch is possible. And thus, this is what we say is an unsatisfiable formula. So it's never possible to hit error. And the really clever trick that these tools play is the following. We took this left branch. I mean, this, this is a very sm small example, so it's not going to illustrate it with lots of pain, right? It's gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, 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 often, the larger the examples get, the bit clearer the, the, the advantage of this optimization becomes. But the, this, this is a very small case. But the idea is, is when you take the left branch, what we do is we learn the root cause as to why the left branch was unsatisfiable. And we actually add that. So notice at the bottom now, I've added that fact to the set of known facts. Right? So it's not changing the satisfiability of that formula to add a bit of extra information. I've conjoined on an extra fact. And that extra fact can now be used to prune the search space in the future. So we go to the left, we try out some stuff, we learn the root cause as to why that was unsatisfiable. We add that into the set of facts that we're tracking. And then when we go to the right branch, we can use that to prune the search space. And that radically reduces the amount of search space that we actually have to explore. And that really is the sort of 
That and two or three other techniques are how these, are how these tools really work under, in the guts. So, so that's, that concludes this idea of how to make MP complete problems feel P time. Often in, for industrial, not random instances, but for, from applications that come from aircraft software, from, from microprocessors, from uh, railway switching, you know, from, from industrial applications, often the problems, although they in theory are NP complete problems, often there's a P time uh, optimization that will, that, will, that will work for them and in, in, in practice that we've been seeing that and, and also at AWS and I'll speak about that. So then the other thing I wanted to talk about was this idea of making undecidable problems feel decidable in practice. So the question here is, and I'll give you a moment to think about it, could this assert ever fail? And here we're going to assume that the values range over mathematical objects, not bit vectors. There's some opportunity for some overflow to cause this or to fail. So this question of can I, so here's an undecidable problem. The problem is can I take any computer program in and with 100% accuracy in a finite amount of time answer the question, can any of the asserts in the program fail? That's an undecidable problem. There, there cannot be an algorithm that solves that problem. But we can fake it, right? So in practice, we can fake it. So the idea in how to fake it is you require just a bit of attention from a really smart person or uh, an algorithm tuned to pretend they're a smart person. And what the smart thing is in this case, so what the, what the smart person does or the algorithm does is they find what we call an inductive invariant. An inductive invariant is the, is the thing that is maintained via all of the commands of the program that, le that, that, that mean the assert can't fail. And we can typically just think about it at the beginning of loops and at the end of loops, or the beginning of procedure calls, the end of procedure calls, et cetera. Any place where there's a, a repeated computation, we need to write down why, what, what is being tracked or what is known about the program such that we know the, that the assert can't fail. And then there's a whole bunch of book work, book, book, um, work that needs to be done. So the, this, the inductive invariant in this case is that, so, so at the end of the execution, we're saying, hey, the result should equal x times y. So really, this loop is implementing multiplication, but only with plus. But during the middle of the execution of the program, there's a slightly stronger inductive invariant, right? So the inductive invariant is that r is equal to y minus i times x, and i and i is positive. And the program establishes that at the beginning of the execution of the loop. It maintains that fact through every iteration of the loop. And when it exits the loop, then we know that the assert can't fail because of that. So there's just a bit of bookkeeping to do. So in logic, and actually using the techniques from the, the, that I was talking about before, this is actually an NP-complete NP problem to check this. For all possible values, and that's the upside down A, for all possible values of x, y, r, and i, does the conditions that hold when we enter into the loop, do they imply this condition that's in yellow? And it turns out uh, it will be true. The next step is the inductive invariant. So for all possible values of x and y and r and i, when we're staying in the loop, so we know that i is strictly greater than 0, and we decrement i and we increment r by x, and the, pre and the, and the inductive invariant holds before the execution of, the, of those commands, does the condition hold after the execution of those commands? And to put that into pure logic, I can introduce some new variables which represent the new values of i and r. So r prime is the new value of r after it's incremented by x, and i prime is, is the new value of i after it's been decremented. And so this is now a question just in uh, first order logic, which we can again answer with tools that I, that, that I talked about before. And then there's this final step that when we're leaving the loop, so we know that i is not positive, but the invariant says that i is positive or equal to 0. Thus, we know that i is equal to 0. So therefore, because r equals y minus i times x, but i is 0, so that means r equals y times x. And that's how we know that the assert can't fail. 
And so what we've done is we've, we've just done a proof by induction about the correctness of the program, and all we needed was a bit of cleverness about finding this inductive invariant, and we proved the correctness of this program. And no, note that this program is, is an infinite state program, right? So we, it, it's not possible to explore all the possible, all the possible states. The only way to reason about this program is, is uh, in a finite amount of time, in a finite amount of space, is using techniques from logic. Um, yeah, I've already said that, basically. Okay, so that, that concludes the part of the talk where I uh, tell you what me mechanized reasoning and mathematical logic is. I hope that was helpful. So the, the next step here is to now talk about what's going on uh, in AWS in this space. So I'll remind you of the shared security model. Uh, we're really looking at two kinds of questions. The one is how to help customers be secure in the cloud. The other kind of questions is securing the cloud. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna describe, so for all of these questions, we have projects going on uh, inside of AWS. Uh, to answer these questions, I'm gonna go through a couple of them. So the first is a, uh, a tool that's in development that reasons about uh, customer EC2 networking configurations. Right? This is really an MP-complete problem. We use some techniques from in, from, that, I, that I described before to solve them. Um, the next, I mean, I also describe in some detail uh, a, a project to prove the correctness of S2N, which is a TLS library, uh, using induction and some techniques, again, uh, as described. So let's discuss this, uh, this first thing about reasoning about networks. So this is a, I, uh, a project that uh, folks in my group are, are involved in. It's a service, it has a CLI, uh, where a uh, number of groups inside of AWS are using it. There are some uh, customers that are, that are involved in a private beta with it. Please contact me if you'd, you'd like to know, know more about that program. Um, it, what it does is it automatically answers queries about EC2 networking configurations. The queries are expressible in a simple query language. And the really important point is that we're not sending packets, we're not using the network we're analyzing your network and logic. And in fact, often we analyze networks that have never even been deployed or never been built, right? So if we, we can take your existing EC2 networking configuration using some described calls and grab the representation that we use, or, or we can build mythical ones that have never even been, been, been deployed. What we've done is we've encoded the, logics, the logic of EC2 networking in logic. Right, so all possible subtle interactions between NAT gateways and availability zones and ACLs and VPC pairing endpoints and load balancers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the different ways that, that, that these pieces can interact and interact with your network are considered during the proof. Again, it's an MP complete question. We can usually answer it in P time using the approaches that's seen before. So what kinds of questions can we ask? So for example, we can ask and answer which EC2 instances are accessible from the internet. This is how you would describe it actually in the, in the query language for the tool. So in this case, there's, there's, there's two modes of use. The one is to, to ask the tool to list things and the other is to answer questions that ultimately have an answer yes or no. So here we're saying, so inst is a variable, and we're saying please list all of the instances inst uh, such that the internet can SSH uh, to the instance. And I have a demo, a video demo of, of um, a case similar to this, so this will be discussed in a little bit more detail. Another question we might ask is, from my VPC, can non-Bastion instances only SSH to the Bastions? So here's how we would express that in the, in the query language. So this is saying, so here we're using, this is a question that the, the answer is yes or no. And we're using all as a keyword in the query language. So we're saying for all possible instances, source and dest, if source has instance type, uh, so has, VP, has VPC, Byron VPC, so that's made up, and the dest is not a bastion, so it's, it's, it's tag name, is value, 
is not Bastion. And the instance source can SSH to dest, then, and that's the arrow, so it's saying then, uh, dest needs to be a Bastion. I'm gonna skip over the other two cases. Currently in the tool, we support the following EC2 networking concepts. Sometimes uh, folks who have used the tool leave the set and so we're working to, to figure out what, 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 what other uh, features of EC2, net, EC2 networking we should support. This is currently what we support. And, and now I'm gonna uh, uh, play a sh short demo video. AWS Security, and I'm here to walk you through our policy checking tool. Imagine we define the following policy for our network. Any host that is externally accessible via SSH needs to be tagged with the label Bastion, and vice versa. To express this policy, we write, for all instances, if an instance has a tag, has a tag name, and the value is set to Bastion, Make sure SSH is globally open on that instance. The double arrow notation checks that the relationship is true in both directions. With our current network configuration, when we run the query, it returns false, alerting us to a policy violation. Let's find and fix the misconfiguration, then rerun our policy check. To dig into the error, we could run each half of the query separately listing the instances tagged as Bastion, a list of one, and then listing the instances externally accessible via SSH, which turns out to be a list of two. The underlying definition of the function internet can SSH to instance can be seen here. Or instead, we could leverage the support provided in the query language and directly ask whether there exists an instance such that the statement is not true. The query returns true, indicating such an instance does exist. To view the instance ID, we change the exists clause to a list clause. Now we know which instance is violating our policy, which security groups are attached to this instance. To find out, we run this query. We can then use the AWS CLI to get the list of rules associated with that security group. Here we can see that this security group indeed allows port 22 traffic in globally. Let's delete that ingress rule. And now rerun our original policy invariant and see that it now holds true. Thanks for walking through this with me. Enjoy reading that. Great, so that's what one of the tools that, that we're working on. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about um, proving correctness of some internal AWS uh, components. So we, here we're discussing uh, something called S2N. So S2N is a small, fast TLS library. It's been rigorously engineered for security. It's open source. Uh, you can contribute to it, you can use it, we contribute to it, we use it internally within AWS. Um, we're involved in an effort to prove the correctness of various aspects of S2N. Um, I'm gonna be describing our proof of its implementation of HMAC. We've uh, been proving a number of other things about it also. This is uh, performed with a tool called SAW which is um, provided to us by a company called Galois. There, I think there are some, you might hold up your hand, there are some folks from Galois here, so if you'd like to talk to, about, talk to them about SAW, you can do. Um, and I'm gonna be hanging out, by the way, at the end of the talk, and I would imagine they will too, so you'd like to ask them questions. Um, and SAW implements uh, some techniques based again on these MP-complete approximation techniques together with some smart reasoning that we've done uh, via induction. An interesting aspect of this work is that we are uh, involved in 
continuous integration, right? So, so there was a bit of work to get the proof expressed in the tool, but, but now the cost of doing that work is amortized over the lifetime of the software. So for every check-in to S2N, the proof is rerun, reestablished, and failed proof attempts usually uh, result in, in, uh, in the introduction of, of bugs to S2N. So they're flagged, or flagged early via, via integration with Travis CIO. That, that, there's going to be a video demo, and that, that'll go, be discussed in that demo. So HMAC is it's this keyed hash message authentication code. It provides authenticity and integrity. Here I've given the definition for, our, for you know, the, the formal definition of what HMAC is. This comes from the, from the um, specification. HMAC takes two things. It takes a, a key and a message. Um, it, it does some stuff with the key to compute these things called K0. The, de the details are in the HMAC specification. And then it uses some, uh, uh, an arbitrary hash function and it uses some constants from NIST. So the tool SAW provides a formal specification language. And so we've translated the HMAC specification into the formal specification, the machine readable formal specification language for the tool SA for SAW. Um, I've, I've written it here. It's, a f it's essentially the same. It actually goes into, it actually makes the, the details a little bit clearer. So it's in some sense, much, much better specification. And I think you will agree, uh, I'm not much more complicated specification. The tricky bit now, oh, I'm having some technical problems. Oh, there it goes. So maybe AV support, or maybe, maybe that'll go away now. So I'm getting spinning uh, symbols. So the, the tricky bit of this work is to, to bridge the gap between the C code that implements the HMAC and S2N and the Cryptol specification. So the Cryptol specification is, is Clear, easy to understand, easy to audit. The C implementation uh, is built for performance, right? Built for small memory size, fast performance, et cetera. And so we're using proof to, to bridge that gap. The, re remember from the part of my talk where I was talking about making the undecidable feel decidable, I said there's, in some sense, an aha step. There's a, either a smart tool or a smart person looks at the problem, writes down, the reason, the, the, in some sense, the reason that the, the program is correct, and then we check all the details, right? As, as Euclid did for the proof of the infinite, infinite number of primes. And that s resides in this lower level cryptol code. So what we're really doing is we're proving that the higher level cryptol code, which, I, which I've shown you, is correct with respect to the lower level cryptol code. And then we do a fairly easy proof that the production S2 encode uh, uh, is, is equivalent to the, to the lower level uh, crypto code. So the, the S2N data structures and APIs are accounted for in the crypto code. Uh, the, the details of pointer arithmetic and lower level performance optimizations are ignored. So that's handled by the proof on the right hand side. So there's a bit of manual work, but for the most part it's automatic. And definitely the, all of the bookkeeping of the, the detailed parts about uh, does this assertion hold at this line, all that kind of stuff, that's all held, held, dealt with automatically by the tool. Um, there's also a bit of reasoning to do about updates. So the HMAC, so the S2N uh, update function can be called many times and there's a question of if I call update twice, is that really the same as calling it once but on a larger message? And so that, that reasoning has been done uh, via induction and the tool. Um, and the, the really exciting thing about this work is that the proofs are replayed automatically in, tra in Travis CI. So a proof failure results in a, in a build failure. And on average, currently the runtime for those proofs is 15 minutes. The proof is relatively agnostic to the C code. So you can add a loop here, change the loop. For the most part, the, the proof will replay with no problem. Um, the, the, the difficulty is when you modify the data structures that S2N is using or you modify the function call structure. Uh, in that case, 
the, the proof structure has to be updated currently by a human. So again, I'm going to show you a, a, a video demo of this in action. Now we're going to show how the verification done by SAW is integrated into the S2N development process. When a user goes to S2N's GitHub page, they are presented with a build passing badge. This indicates that the code builds, the regression tests pass, and also that all of the SAW HMAC proofs succeed against the current version of the code. Clicking on this badge takes us to the Travis CI page for S2N, where we can see the results of these checks, which occur every time there is a push to the S2N Git repo. This is the log from the Travis checks and shows the result of a SAW run. We can see that we're verifying the HMAC algorithm with SHA-256, a key size of 64, and message size of 1. Each individual verification checks that the code returns the correct result for any possible message and key of the given sizes. It then returns a JSON output that contains statistics such as the proof time and complexity. We then scrape these automatically and generate graphs summarizing the checks that were run as well as information about each function that was analyzed. For demo purposes, we've created our own Travis instance that does a single run of the SAW HMAC checks so that we can quickly see the change in output as we make changes to the code. We're going to show how SAW integrates into the development workflow, accepting correct changes and flagging any errors that are introduced. We'll focus on the S2N HMAC update function, which you can see here. One interesting thing about this function is that it involves a rather strange constant. The comment above explains that this constant was introduced to protect against a timing attack and should have no effect on the mathematical result. If that's true, we should be able to remove this constant completely. We'll do that, save the file, and push the update to Git. As soon as we do the push, Travis will run all the SAW proofs again, and because of the proof automation incorporated into SAW, the new code will pass without the programmer explicitly updating the proof itself. This is important as it lets the proof checking operate in a very similar manner to compilation and testing from a workflow perspective. So Travis has already started the new build. It compiles the code, executes SAW, and produces this green text which indicates that SAW has succeeded in showing that the code is a correct implementation of HMAC for the given message and key sizes. So now we'll look at what happens if we make a mistake. What we'll do is increase this constant by 1. This breaks the correctness condition that the constant should be 0 mod all the HMAC block sizes. So we've just pushed that change, and now we'll go back to Travis to see what happens. In this case, when SAW finishes, it generates some red text indicating that the proof failed. And SAW has also generated a counterexample, which is a set of inputs that show a case where the code fails to give the correct result. This can be turned into a test case that can be passed to the developers to help them debug the code. Here we're looking at the details of the SAW output, but on the GitHub page this would be summarized as a red badge, indicating that one of the code checks has failed for the given commit. Now in this demo, Travis was triggered by the code pushes we did, but it also runs on every pull request, so developers can see feedback from the SAW tool as they're deciding whether to merge contributed changes. This acts as a very strong check on the quality of submitted code, augmenting manual code review, and providing developers with a high degree of assurance about the correctness of code changes without requiring any extra effort on their part. Great, so I'm gonna say that that concludes my uh, effort to describe in some detail uh, examples of what we're doing in this space. Um, I began the talk with this uh, idea of the shared security model that questions about security fall into two camps. Questions about the customer's exposure to security problems uh, via misconfigured VPCs, misconfigured policies, and also questions that come up about the security of the underlying components that f form AWS. I've given you examples of uh, uh, two projects, one to reason about customer uh, EC2 networking, uh, the other to prove the correctness of the crypto primitives. We actually have projects going on in the uh, re relevant to the other questions, so about policies and about um, the virtualization layer. Um, that concludes uh, my talk, I, I did have a, a couple of reminders in order of, of, of business. So m my name is Byron, my e email address is byron at amazon.com, so you, you can contact me with, with questions. I'm going to be hanging out uh, now, now uh, for, for a while, and I'm also going to 
be at the security booth tomorrow at 3 p.m. Um, I wanted to, to give a pointer to another talk that's uh, it's by Cole McCarthy. It's um, Net 405 is the name of the talk. It's, a, it's about S2N, um, the, the TLS library that we're doing proofs of correctness on. That's Thursday, December 1st at 1230 in one of the rooms in the Venetian. So if you're interested in uh, S2N, TLS, uh, or the pr proof stuff, so Colm has been involved in that, in that, in that work too. And, then I, and I wanted to also uh, point out that the, the, the collaborators that we have in, in Galois, uh, in, in particular one of the uh, people who's been, who we've been working very closely with on the SAW tool is, is here now and I, and I think we'll be staying here after the end of my lecture. So if you'd like to ask questions of us, uh, please feel free to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you.